don't need the microphone, but I'll, sh I'll sh use it anyway to pick up my importance. How are we all doing? We okay? Yeah, excellent. Thanks for coming today. It's obviously a very intimate session, which is great for you guys that have come to this session. Um, so today's session, we have Len Brown from McClarty, Brown, McClarty Media Productions. McCarthy Brown Media Productions and Bridget Bosley from WAG Entertainment. So Bridget Bosley is creative director. Got that one right. Uh, and Len is producer at McClarty Brown Media. Got that right again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. And interviewing Bridget and Len today is Tim Smith from the Actors Workshop. So we just have a quick round of applause for our guests today, please. So I think really unique session today because Len and Bridget have both had long established careers delivering for net, both network telly but also for streaming services as well and so you're going to get a really useful insight about how to have a long established career making content uh, for various broadcasters um, and sustaining that whilst being able to have a base in Nottingham but have work that takes you not only all over the country but all over the world in many instances as well. So yeah, another round of applause for our guests today please and enjoy the session. So we've got microphones. Do you want? Do you want them? Do we need them? Yeah. 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 There you go. We do. Uh, I'm assuming probably for Hello. the purposes of recording. Hello. Av. Yeah. Uh, how are you both? Very well, thank you. Very, Very good. Uh, yes. Nice chicken here. wrap in uh, antenna. Chicken wrap is good. Although uh, students chips even better. Chips are great as well, weren't they? Um, and you, you're both local. Yeah, Southwell or Southwell, depending on you know, whether you were born there or if you were an incomer. So which one do you go for? Uh, well, I'm Southwell. I was born in Woolerton. But, oh, um, so was I. Oh, yeah, there that. you go. Small world, eh? Local girl. Yeah. I was born in Coldstream in Scotland. As in, like, the Coldstream Guard. As in, yeah. the, that's what it's famous for, yeah, yeah Coldstream yeah. Guards, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm not from here. I'm only here because Bridget moved here. Um, and uh, her parents helped us with childcare. And I, commu I commute to London. I have done for 20 years, so that's why I look ancient, but taking its toll. So um, it's po but that's possible, don't. though, because there'll be people Just here about. <laughs> thinking about making, that, making the move to London, thinking about where they base themselves. So it, it, it's tenable. Um, y yes, I'm not sure I would recommend it. I mean, I don't think you're meant to do it for long, but... Um, uh, <coughs> I, I worked in London and in Manchester for many years and then when we were in Manchester I got offered a, a job in London that I wanted to do but I didn't want to move to London with two small children or we didn't want to move so we moved yeah. to Nottingham and I've commuted since then. So this was when you were a TV factual commissioner for ITV between yes, the years yeah. of 2003 to 2006. Oh, that's very good. You know my career better than me. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> when it was. <laughs> good. Um, <coughs> so I was, I was running a big department for uh, Yorkshire Television, um, and I got this job offered in London, which was a really good, you know, interesting job. I really wanted to do it, but at the same time, it seemed a lot to move from Manchester down to London. <coughs> and so it is possible because, you know, I commute on the East Coast line then it, it, from Newark into London, which does take about an hour and a half, but often the, a lot longer because the trains don't run or they're cancelled or they're delayed or there are strikes. So I wouldn't recommend it, but I would say that it's possible to do. I don't go full time. I do work full time, but I don't go there full time. It's possible to do. Um, but these days, a lot of um, the industry has has been forced to move out of London, which is a really, really good thing. So now there's a vibrant industry in Manchester, much uh, more supported than it was when we were there. Yeah. And in yeah. Leeds, Channel 4 have moved to Leeds. Obviously, the regions are being very well supported. So uh, Glasgow and also Cardiff. Um, and then in the more west of the country, Birmingham. Uh, well, Birmingham and uh, Bristol. So I think there's a lot more choices now than when you know we were doing it, uh, where London was very, very much the focus. I think you've got a lot more opportunity now to work outside of London and have a really successful career, you know, in in one of the other areas that that have a TV industry that can support you living there. Where see Nottingham at the moment just doesn't really have that yet. And uh, Len, how about yourself? Your your um, business, your organisation, your company, 
production team, everything based in Nottingham? How does it work yeah, for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, like Bridget, I mean, we, we met in Manchester. I used to be a journalist, a music journalist, um, then worked in TV as a researcher. We both worked our way up, sort of researcher, uh, assistant producer, producer, exec producer. Um, and then Bridge went on to commissioning. Um, I sort of got to exec producer and decided I didn't like the management side of it, so I'm, I've stayed as a producer. So I think that's where the power is in in um, in production. You know, you come up with the ideas, you, you manage the budgets. But um, I think that um, it, it strangely, um, and I, I met Jamie um, and I think Alison a, a, a few years ago. There was more TV production in Nottingham, so more people were staying in this area, um, and you know, lots more crew were here. Uh, and, and production staff. But um, so 20 years ago, there were big series coming out of Nottingham. But then those, those uh, regional TV seemed to <coughs> decline. Um, and I found myself, I, I was mainly traveling to Manchester, sometimes to Leeds, mainly to London as well. Mm. Um, so what we've tried to do, and it's only really happened in the last sort of five or six years, is build our little company, McClarty Brown Media, in Nottingham and get commissions here and try and use local local staff, um, uh, certainly local crew. It's been difficult. It's been difficult because, uh, you know, if you've got one or two other things going on in the area at the same time, like Shane Meadows' film pr productions, um, there's one or two other dramas um, that have been done from Nottingham. Uh, and when they're when they're on, it's really difficult to find the crew. So sometimes we're still bringing people in from less from London, but certainly from Manchester, certainly from Leeds. So it's it, it's a challenge, but it's getting better, I think. Um, and um, the BBC has been very good to us. You know, we'll, we'll, you know we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the you know the things that we've done have, have mainly been BBC. We've we've done a Sky Arts production as well, but it's mainly been BBC support and we've got some BBC funding now as well to support the company. And the aim I think is in the TV industry is to have 50% of production, maybe more, coming from the regions. So it's quite a good time to, to for you guys to be starting out and working in the regions. Brilliant. Well, um, there's so much to get into. I mean, really fascinating and insightful around commissioning. Uh, your background as a uh, music journalist and the kind of influence that that's had on you and your career so far. And obviously, you've recently won an RTS award. Yeah. You've recently been uh, granted um, some uh, budget to kind of develop and produce. Uh, so really exciting times, and uh, we're very, very lucky to have you. Um, i quite like to just kind of meet a little bit of the audience, uh, just because it's kind of ideal, I suppose, to focus it around, um, well, make sure you're getting something out of this. Um, can I just find out who we got in the room? So have we got any one that's kind of purely focusing or wants to focus on producing at all? Anyone thinking about producing? Yeah? Unsure? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. A few hands going up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether that, that changes over here um, <laughs> or, or you feel inspired by it. Because I think producing is a bit mystical, isn't it, when uh, people set off? Because it's not, directing feels fairly uh, clear, but producing not so much. Uh, what about directors or just filmmakers in general? Yeah. Um, anyone, it, sort of crew, DOPs? Yeah. So lots of that as well. Um, and then how about um, the kind of the other? What, I mean, how do we class that sort of commissioning? Uh, execing. Do people know much about that? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I, I think that's. I spoke to Jamie earlier and was just saying that, you know, how how useful is that to, to you as people that perhaps haven't even sort of thought about that as careers? But I, I think it's it's hugely valuable because uh, you you are the the commission TV commissioners of the future. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, let's let's talk about the kind of how you you got into it then maybe like what was your sort of route in. Well, <coughs> I, um, I did some work experience at BBC Radio Nottingham. Um, I sort of always knew I wanted to be in television production. Um, and I didn't do a degree in it because there wasn't any degrees, because I'm far too old. There wasn't any TV production degrees. Um, I did a psychology degree. But um, 
I worked a bit uh, for free at Radio Nottingham, but it's always people in your life that give you a break. And there was a producer at BBC Radio Nottingham um, who encouraged me to apply for different jobs that you got in this m internal magazine at the time called Ariel. And um, I did apply to a job in television, in, and it was in Manchester. It was a daytime program, and, as, and I got a job as a researcher. Um, I was really fortunate, again, right place, right time, that this whole division from the BBC, called, it was called Youth Programmes at the time, run by a woman called Janet Street Porter, were relocated to Manchester more or less as soon as I got there. And they did really exciting shows, not this daytime stuff I was on. You know, I couldn't wait to get out. So she was doing travel programmes called Rough Guide to the World and current affairs programmes called Reportage. And it was all really edgy and new and felt exciting in terms of the way that it was shot, the way that it looked. Um, and I um, applied to get into that unit. But because I was already there and I was in Manchester, I was already doing a researcher's job, it sort of was easy. I think it would have been quite difficult for me to have got into that straight away. So I stayed there. I stayed at the BBC for 10 years in that department um, and just rose up through the ranks to uh, being a series producer. So that's how I started. So, yeah, you, you charted a path in the, sort of the traditional sense with um, researcher all yeah. the way through to what is yeah. the kind of top top job really as series producer where you're controlling and managing i mean just for those people that perhaps don't even sort of have a familiarity right. with that with yeah. that that, that t job description of series yeah. producer i mean um tv production is about working on shows essentially you know so you there are, you have a team of people in production and you it'll vary between series producer will be you know running it well there'll be the exec that that's completely in charge of the editorial and the budget and the delivery to the channel but that every show has a team and you know that's recruited so you might have so many researchers so many APs so many producers these days not very many because budgets are tight uh, and you know producer directors and you will have a schedule and you'll have a time scale of which you then work on that program and you deliver the 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 final product so you just it's experience really that enables you to move up more experience you've got. So first of all, in researching, you'd be, you'd be story finding, finding contributors, thinking about how you might want to tell those stories that in your particular show. Assistant producing, you have more responsibility, but it's essentially the same job. By the time you're producing, you are probably taking on more responsibility, maybe thinking taking on a whole episode. And as the word series producer suggests, you are responsible for the entire series. So how you're going to break down the episodes, what your narrative arcs are going to be, you know, the distribution of the contributors throughout the episodes, how's that going to work? Uh, you also have an eye to the budget and schedule and keep, because TV is essentially, uh, yes, it's about, you know, making product that entertains people, but it's also about making money. People don't do it for nothing. And, you know, your companies have profit they have to deliver, you have targets you have to deliver. So you have to keep these shows on budget and you have to think of creative ways of doing that. Um, uh, you have uh, production management, that's a really interesting and underfunded and under-resourced at the moment. Mm -hmm. People are desperate for production managers in television. And that role is really interesting. You start as coordinator and that's much more coordinating crews, schedules, um, and uh, bookings, you know, the whole organisation around TV, the, the production that you're on, and then production manager does that, plus they also run the production budget. Uh, and then you might have a production executive that is in charge of a slate of programmes, but they are really budget focused. So TV is all about creativity, but it is also about creativity within a certain framework of money it isn't you know it's not never ending and so m making your programs work effectively um, is hard work these days because budgets are a lot smaller people have to work incredibly hard and I think the worst thing for TV in in production like that and in, in and if you all the production managers will hire the DOPs will hire the sound they'll hire the editors you know that's all part of your team on that particular show um, but it's freelance and that's hard, you know, for people. It's, you, you're only as good as your last job and your job might only be four months and then you've got to be thinking about another job. 
while you're in the c job that mm. you're in. Mm. Um, and it is a really, really difficult um, life for young people in TV, I think, the freelance mm. nature of it. Um, and you've got to be good because if you are good, the people that you work with will say, oh, we need a AP or we need a producer on our next. Or what about them? They were really good. We'll ring them to see whether they're free. Once you're in, it's all about who you know, what relationships you make, and how good you were at your last project. Most jobs in TV are not done by an uh, advertisement. They just aren't. There, there are some sites that I'm sure you're all aware of, Production Base and Talent Manager, where people put their details on. And you know, most companies have a HR person who will look at that and think about the qualities they need for a certain project and start to call people, get them in for interview. But th there isn't the, w in my day, there used to be mm. in the garden on a Monday, you'd look at the adverts for jobs, but it just isn't that sort of a world anymore. So getting in is almost the hardest part. Once you're in, it's just being good and keeping your ear to the ground about what's going on. Well, you obviously were very successful and very prof professional, um, uh, and you must have dealt with all of that, um, the complications around that really well, and to be where you are now. And in regards but, to... But I just will say, mm. just to interrupt, it was easier because we were given longer contracts. Right. I think it's much harder now, mm. and I do think that's something in TV that needs to, to mm. change. Yeah. Uh, just can I clarify something? And that is the series producer. Wh what's the sort of correlation between a series producer and a showrunner? And I appreciate a showrunner is a more, more of an American the term. So it's yeah. the American term for a series producer. Because you've probably heard showrunner a lot, right? Because uh, that's something you hear a lot. Showrunner tends to be on larger reality style shows, bigger entertainment shows. You don't often have a showrunner on a documentary. Right. OK. Um, and Len, how about you? What was what was your sort of journey into it all? Well, I, I, as I say, I was a music journalist. I was, I was a newspaper journalist. I, you know, was basically started off chasing fire engines and doing all that stuff. I, I uh, trained at Westminster Press, worked on evening papers um, and weekly papers. And then I went to NME. I got a job on the New Musical Express, which was then quite a big music paper. It was, like um, huge. Well, it was the biggest, wasn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it, it was a great place to work. And from there, I got basically headhunted by... Janet Street Porter, where I met, met Bridget, uh, Def 2. I mean, I was one of the older people, actually, in youth television at that point. Um, so that was quite... But, but I was very sort of music-focused. I had great contacts in the music industry, so I tended to work on music stories within Rough Guys to the World, um, within Reportage. There was a series called Dance Energy, was like, which was like sort of... Oh, er yeah, the clips keep coming back on my Facebook, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Normski. Um, Normski. I'm, I'm friends with Normski on Facebook <laughs> just because oh, yeah, of that, well, yeah, yeah. I'm Norman, yeah. Oh, blimey. Um, kick the can. Yeah, kick the can. Um, so, yeah, so I, I suppose I had a sort of specialism quite early on. Uh, and I think that that's a really good way to get into telly, is, to, is if you've got a real passion, then, you know, find... You know, and you like certain programs, you know, find who makes them and, and contact them. Because, you know, if you've got that speciality, that sort of sets you apart in terms of recruitment. If they're looking for people who've got ideas. Um, and, um, yeah, and so, so a lot of the stuff I've worked on over the years has been talent base. You know, early, early things that I produced. There's a guy called Jules Holland, I don't know whether you know, who does later... Uh, on BBC he was, he was here a few years ago, wasn't he, Jules? Yeah, yeah. so he did a, a, does a big music series. It's been running for years on BBC. But I did one of the early versions of that. Uh, I worked on that. Um, and then I, I did a big uh, series with Tom Jones here in, in Nottingham. This is like 25 years ago. Um, and that, you know, that was bringing in major artists from all over the world, performing with like Stevie Wonder... Um, if he means anything to people here, uh, you know, it, it, he came to uh, to Lenton Lane in Nottingham, you know, which was like a great day. Um, so I used to do a lot of that sort of stuff, um, and um, I, gu I guess uh, you know I've, I've sort of built the career from there. I made loads of programs for Channel Four uh, as a producer, um, a lot of BBC stuff, mainly music, some arts. The rough guide thing, just going back to that, I mean, that was a fantastic job because we basically got to travel the world. You know, we, we were being sent, you know, for six weeks to, I mean, Bridge went to Hawaii, <coughs> uh, 
uh, you know, I, I, was, I was like Greece, Puerto Rico, um, you know, all, all sorts of different places. I mean, you, you, I mean, Bridge ended up <laughs> running it actually at one point, but. Um, yeah, no, it was a great job. I loved that job. <laughs> I'm not going to deny it. Um, yeah, it was a nice way to spend your 20s, uh, you know, being paid by the BBC to go to Zimbabwe or, you know, Sicily or uh, Guatemala. I can't remember where else I went. I went a lot of places. Yeah. Just add, adding from what Bridge said before, though, about the, the various jobs, I mean, it really is a team... <coughs> A team, you know, TV production is a real team game. That's one of the great things about it. You know, I, I mean, I, I write as well, but that's quite a lonely uh, business. You know, so TV production, you know, when you're, when you're working with people you get on with, and people from different backgrounds, different ages, uh, different, different sort of skill levels, but, but different, you know, different crafts. Um, you know, so it, it is really a team thing. You, c you don't get many people doing it all on their own. Um, and the other thing we didn't mention is edit editors. You know, I, th I think, you know, it, finding good editors, you know, being a good editor. There is, is such so a much demand at the moment as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a, a really um, difficult job. Um, and uh, particularly in this area, uh, there's, there's a guy, uh, I'm sure he's spoken here, Lucas Roach, who works with Shane Meadows. And, like, you know, if Lucas isn't available, you're sort of stuffed in Nottingham, really, because... It, you know, I mean, obviously Shane Meadows is a bigger player than we are, but um, you know, so so if if someone can, if there's any good editors here, just get in touch. Any editors? <laughs> Anyone really keen? Yeah, you're like that with everything, though. Yeah, you were you're into you were wanting to be in musicals as well. I thought you want to be do Cats or Starlight Express. <laughs> Was that from the other day? Yeah, <laughs> many talents. Um, so just, just kind of picking up from where you just left off there, because it's probably a good point to ask that question. Is there anything sort of in your early career, possibly, you know, going right back to the beginning, that you, that if you knew that, what you, from what you know now, that you would have done differently? Or, or um, kind of key bits of wisdom around that journey? No, I, th I think that uh, main, mainly because I was sort of set in a cer on a certain path because of the music stuff, I would have liked to have tried other things you know i think if you've got the opportunity to work on different things then you can decide which route you want to go um the great you know it, it it i suppose it happens less now because a lot more work is remote but in the old days if you used to be in a building say you're in the bbc and you had an extension in the bbc you know and you could go to the canteen and meet other people working on different programs i mean that was a really you you've just got a network find ways of networking. Um, you know, Bridge was saying about uh, all these uh, job sites and things like that. There's, there's some great Facebook groups. You know, there's, there's real, you know, like there's a Northern, is it called Northern Talent? Which is a really, TV, talent in, TV talent in the North, which is a really good, you know, and anyone could go on that, you know, and you could, they're often looking for runners. So just, you know, put yourself around really um, and make sure people know who you are and what sort of thing you do. Um, I'm trying to think what the other ones Yeah, You mentioned production base. Um, I guess that that's... The, the, I used to run an organisation, a training organisation as well. But I took a break from telly um, and I was a managing director of something called the Indie Training Fund, which is now called um, Screen Skills. And they do subsidised courses. Uh, some of them are online courses... Yeah, most of them are in London. Some of them are regional as well. But just get as many, do as many of those courses when you've got time so that you've, you've just got... I mean, sometimes they're things like health and safety. Sometimes they're things like um, digital workflow. They're, they're just things that will... There's lots of camera skills courses and some editing skills as well. But uh, it, it's those other things that are really useful. Um, you know, just... Uh, uh, I suppose um, data wrangling, the whole the whole data wrangling. I mean, that's a that's a really important job, uh, you know. And it's a lot of responsibility, and it tends to be someone quite young, who is a bit tech savvy, who who can do that job. But but people like us can't do it. That's why we need you, because we we don't know how to sort of save our own our own files securely. And yet, I think there's got to be like three. Some of the contracts say it's got to be backed up three times. 
for insurance purposes, and you're sort of on location thinking, you're looking around thinking, who the hell's going to... Someone, who... someone backed up the footage. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so, so there's, there's all those jobs that you guys all know what they mean and how important they are. Um, so we, we need, yeah, we need the next generation to come through and, um, and do the work that we can't do. Anything that you know now, Bridget, that you wish you'd known back then? I don't know, because I think naivety sometimes is, stands you in quite good stead. I mean, I wasn't from... I didn't know anyone who worked in TV. I've got no connections. Um, and I think, really, maybe that helped. There's something about um, being driven by... I would say that to everyone, by driven what you really like. I say to our children, um, you have to work a long time in your life, and you may as well get out of bed every day and do something that you want to do. Um, and I suppose that's been my main guiding. Even if it's travelling to London. Yeah, but when I get there, I like what I do. Just don't like the travel. But I think you've just got to. If, I think if you're passionate and inspired, in whatever it is you do, you will probably be good at it. Um, and so I wouldn't ever. And I never did that, so I suppose I, I, I stuck to what I wanted to do. I've made bad decisions along the way, there's no doubt about it, but when you say, but in the early career, no, I, I, I went for something that I wanted to do. My parents were like, what? Working in television, well, who do you think you are? <laughs> you know, like, it wasn't a thing that my parents or family thought was a good move. I should have been a doctor, or I should have, you know, I actually can't possibly say accounting because I'm so bad at maths. But I should have done something that my education, you know, they, they thought would be more fitting. So I would say if you've got a passion for something, stick to it and see how far you get. Well, you are obviously successful at winning RTS awards. Uh, congratu congratulations on that. Um, I think it'd be a good time to watch a bit of a clip, if that's okay with you. And we discussed how we might show these, but it feels like perhaps showing um, your uh, musical family Christmas would be a good place to start, seeing as it's something quite pertinent to where you're at now and has led to other things. So um, if we could queue up a clip, um, that would be great. We're going to look at uh, clip three of the musical family Christmas to put that into some context for so, you. So that's, a, that's an MBM production. That's the you know, Lens yeah, Company. Yeah. 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 So, and, and obviously the family, it's, it's not a very seasonal programme at, at the moment, but um, the family, uh, uh, the Canny Mason family are from Nottingham. So the whole thing was, it was funded by BBC England. So they're putting money into regional productions. So we got a chunk of money from them and we had to do as much as we could in Nottingham. So some of it sh shot at their home in Mapley Park uh, and the studio stuff sh shot here in this very building. Um, with the great people of Metronome. Yeah, confetti students are on the credits. I was they? just going to say, although it's funded by BBC England, it's a network, it's not a yeah, regional yeah, yeah. production. It went out on Christmas Day on BBC Two at 8 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So prime time slot mm. did very well. Uh, how, how did it come about? Um, well, we've... Um, Bridget worked on a programme about Sheku Kani Mason, who's the young cellist who played at Harry and Meghan's wedding. Uh, Sheku was Young Musician of the Year in 2017. But the first black and first state-educated Young Musician of young the Year. So of the I year. thought, that's a good story. I'll give him a call. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and I was, obviously I was also equally fascinated. They were from Nottingham. So I got in touch with them. I went round to visit them and said, you know, I'm, I'd like to do a documentary on you, I'd like to follow you for the six months after your win. And um, BBC Arts commissioned it, um, and that's exactly what I did. It was just, you know, uh, sort of following him through. He got a record deal, he's got a record deal with Decca. He played at the proms, you know. I, I just sort of followed those key moments in his life. But also, I got in, I, I got in with the family in the house, and, you know, it, it is incredible. There are seven of them, and they all play music to a almost you know a, mm. a half of them are professional already with record deals and the other the others are still at school so um you know to see what it's like living in a, a house with everyone playing music gives a great um substance to your documentary i mean you've got so much going on and you've got so many personalities and uh and a black family who are 
you know, in the elitist sort of world of classical music is unusual. So there was a lot, there's a lot to play with there as a documentary. Well, um, let's have a quick look at the clip. I mean, you, you've, you've talked there a lot about access and finding, sniffing out a good story. So, um, yeah, and I know that's something that's going to be uh, kind of crop, keep cropping up, so we'll, we'll revisit that. But if we could just watch this uh, short clip now from a musical family Christmas, please. Well, when Caddy and I decided to get married, we talked about children quite early on, and Caddy said, how many children do you want? And I said, oh, three, because I was always one of two, and I wanted a brother, so I said three. I said, that's not enough, and I wanted four, so he kindly agreed to four. We joked that we added that together and made seven. So we wanted a big family, and seven is, is, is a good number. But what it really was, was I got my way, because I was very happy to have seven. And he very, he's very happy now. <laughs> oh, gosh, can I remember all the names? I know he started fucking with So Eister's our oldest. She's very much a pianist. She's 25 now. Isata was definitely the trailblazer. We introduced her to the piano because she was just so bright and we just needed something to occupy her mind. She was the one who was achieving everything musically before anyone else. And she was the one who Sheku and Brahma and everyone else looked up to. And then there's Brahma who comes next. Now, he's the thinker. He's also very much in charge of their rehearsals because he's the one with a very, very good ear and he's very meticulous about that. Next is Sheku, who is 22, plays the cello. Sheku is the naughty one. As a child, he was always the one playing tricks. He was always the one we couldn't really control. But he's also the one who always wants to kind of grandstand when they're performing together. So who's next? Next is Konya. So there's the smallest age gap. Konya is 21. Konya is incredibly funny. She would be the one who, in the middle of a performance, has to do a big flourish at the end. Uh, who's next? Jennifer. How old is Jennifer now? Jennifer's 19 and um, a pianist as well. And uh, I've got that one wrong with Jennifer. I think Jennifer's 18. <laughs> Jennifer, she's the one who I suppose is the quietness in the centre. When she plays, is a very dreamy player, very thoughtful, very deep. And then there's Aminata, who's the drama queen. She is always a great performer. And then last but not least is Mariatu, who is 12. She is always in a dream and just plays beautifully because she's following everybody else and watching them. two different types of performances they do. One is very scripted chamber music, so it could be Haydn, it could be Mozart, it could be Mendelssohn. And then they are the arrangements that they make of pieces they love. And those are the pieces I love the best, which just come from between them. It's lovely. Oh, Santa Baby is a fan song, but it's, I mean, it, it also has like a, quite a cool feeling and a, and a vibe. It's a little bit on the cheesy side, but sometimes a bit of sugar and honey and. Um, Sweetness is nice. We all like arranging pieces and we all like experimenting with music. 
Although classical music is our main focus and what we do, I think it's always nice when you can kind of combine things and bring lots of different styles into your play. We really enjoy playing together as a family. Being with your siblings and also doing something that you all take part in is really inclusive for all of us, and so it's something we can all relate to. There you go. Wow. I, I wanna, every time I see that family, I'm like, oh, I wish I lived in that family. Like, why, why couldn't my life be more like that? <laughs> Um, so, uh, can you tell us about kind of the post-releasing of that and um, the sort of impact it's had on things going forward? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, sorry. Um, well, I, I think that um, we're talking about access. I think we are very lucky that we've got this relationship with them because we're now working on the fourth um, documentary that they've been involved in. Uh, they were also in a Sky Arts documentary. Three of them performed in a Sky Arts documentary we did uh, about um, um, a composer who lived 100 years ago, a black composer, black British composer, um, who died in tragic circumstances and was a victim of, of racism um, uh, in sort of Victorian Edwardian times. S Sam Sam Samuel, Samuel Coleridge, Coleridge Taylor. Taylor. Yeah, Samuel Coleridge Taylor, who um, is now sort of getting the credit he deserves as a composer... 100 years on um, so uh, the family were involved in that um, and this summer we've we've got another commission to work with them we're taking them to Salzburg in Austria which is the home of the sound of music and also Mozart uh, Mozart's birthplace and we're making um, a documentary there with them and again we'll be filming at Metronome in October if we can get the dates right and the deal right. And <coughs> I mean, the sell on the Sound of Music is obviously there are seven children, there are seven Von Trapps, and there are seven Canet Masons. So it's the world's most famous... Do you, do you know the Sound of Music story, you guys? You, yeah, does everyone know it? Yeah, good. Can it's anyone sing the song? <laughs> Hills are alive. Anyone want to go? <laughs> it's on <laughs> telly Len? every Christmas. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I feel like I should be singing here. Like some sort of so, old yeah. crooner. <laughs> Like jazz, uh, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, the nice. Von Trapps were a real family, uh, a musical family, um, and obviously the Canon Masons are a musical family, so the parallels of, of, of that is what we'll be exploring in Salzburg. Mm. It's not just mm. they're just going to Salzburg. No, and it's a true story. Mm. The, the, the story of the Sound of Music is a true story. I mean, there's some, there, there was some, um, they took some liabilities with the mm -hmm. true story, but by and large, you know, it is about a family who... Um, Fled because of Nazi, per Nazi, yeah, Nazi persecution, persecution. Uh, Nazi occupation of, of Austria. Um, so it, so th th there's resonance there, I think. We know war going on in Europe, um, refugees fleeing. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, there's lots of things we can look at within that programme. How, how much of that was in your pitch? Like, or was it just because they're the Cane Masons, you could get that made and because you've done it before? No, a full pitch, you can't get anything commissioned without a full written pitch deck document and often you need a sort of sizzle tape to accompany it. it Does this make, you, you understand what these things are, yeah? Cool, thank you. So, okay. you know, Taste of tape, sizzle tape, yeah. 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 You, it's impossible, you have to outline exactly what your vision is for the show. Um, you know, it, it, name recognition alone won't do it. If the BBC or ITV or whomever the commissioner is gonna pay you a considerable amount of money to make it, they need assurance exactly what you think you can deliver um, based again on a tariff you know it can't be a never-ending pot of money so you have to shape your editorial vision to what the tariff slot would be for what you're going to get paid and I keep mentioning the money simply because it's a really important part of your creative vision because it can't just be they pay you know you can get good budgets and you should definitely think about what you want to do with that money and how you want to spend it um, <coughs> because getting as much value on screen and getting as much, you know, creative ideas on screen uh, that you should demonstrate in your pitch document what your ideas are, you know, what you want to do, because that, that will get you... There's so many hurdles to get through mm. before you get a green light that the more you can 
um, express what your vision for the film is on paper and with a sizzle tape, the much, much more likely you are to get a commission. Mm. And, and different channels pay different tariffs. You know, that, so some of the things Bridget has made for, say, for Channel 5 would be a lower budget than the Netflix series, which is obviously a massive budget. Which you've done, which we're going to have a look at yeah. in, in shortly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the, t the tariff is the amount that's paid by the broadcaster. Um, and and you, you do have to, you have to come up with a draft budget. Um, you have to submit a big treatment. And then you get to the stage where there's um, a, what they call a comm spec, which you have to write down exactly what you're going to give to the broadcaster as part of this, as part of the deal. And then it's all, you know, it, 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 it's a contractual process. Um, and you, as, a, as a small production company, you get a production fee, a percentage of it, it, it becomes a production fee, which hopefully helps develop the company further. Um, but if you overspend, then, you know, your production fee is hit or gone. Because they're all fr fixed price deals. It doesn't matter if you say, oh, do you know what, but we had this problem with that and the other problem with the other and we haven't got finished in time and we've gone over. They're not, not really interested mm. uh, in, in that. So you have to make the, you know, make the money fit and, and deliver on time as well. There's always a delivery date. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's very strict operationally. Um, I think if you work as a lone filmmaker and you can, you can, you know, you're not de dependent on, you know, uh, other funding for other big amounts of funding. You have got much more flexibility. But if you are wanting to make for big broadcasters and get funded well, that funding doesn't come easily. It comes with a lot of responsibilities and and schedules and obligations. You know, and one of the big obligations for me as, as creative director and as head of department for various, you know, ITV and, and Channel f um, and the BBC in the past is I'm l legally in com uh, responsible for the compliance of the programme. So, so I spend a lot of my time talking to lawyers now, to be perfectly honest with you. It's, you know, once the nice bit of me, uh, of us making the programme, obviously with a, you know, we know what we can do and we know about, you know, you will get trained in all that about consent and casting people and duty of care to your contributors. There's an awful lot of that work that goes on, even more so these days, given the, some of the awful scenarios that have happened, you know, vis-a-vis -vis things like the Jeremy Kyle show, a um, situation that have strengthened the all duty of care responsibilities to your contributors. But um, legally you have to make sure that what you're putting out is, is factually accurate and correct and, and, and evidenced, quite frankly. You know, it's a, uh, you, the delivery of the final paperwork to the broadcaster is immense and the responsibility for it being legally compliant is with the production company, not with the broadcaster. So if anyone's going to sue you, they sue you and not the broadcaster. Which is pretty crazy, isn't it? It's just a weight of responsibility yeah. to bear in mind that you can't just put anything out on TV. It really has to be, you know, very legally compliant. Um, uh, and it's easier on some shows than, 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 than others, but documentaries can be difficult in that sense. Mm. But particularly as you've gone into that true crime area, haven't you? You're doing a lot of true crime stuff, which is obviously in vogue at the moment. Everyone's watching true co crime documentaries. Mm. So um, uh, that's big business. Well, maybe just before we look at clip four, don't pick up the phone, seeing as we've sort of segued into um, the Netflix um, miniseries, don't pick up the phone, um, that you've been working on, Bridget, and you've delivered. Um, if there's people in the audience that are sitting here thinking, yeah, I've got a TV show, I, I want to pitch this, I want to get it made, and I know from working with some of the students that they are doing that on a smaller scale with their short mm -hmm. films at the moment as part of their course. Um, in fact, I had talked to them about pitching um, and doing that. Like... How could they? How could they? Can they pitch to a TV channel? And if they can't, what's the process they could go through to make that sort of thing a reality? Um, well, I think there's always most of the broadcasters have uh, short film slots. They have some sort of competitions, or or they usually um, reserve certain slots uh, for for that sort of film. I mean, it, it's the same as with long-form documentary. It's all about the storytelling. Everything's about the storytelling. Yes, access might be important in some areas of documentary making, but if you've got a really good story, um, and also I think if you've got access to 
um, maybe a story or access to people who can tell a story that hasn't been seen before on television. I know that's a, a, a big ask, but I think particularly for, for our generation and the generation below us who are commissioners, um, they're not reaching the sort of 16, 24 uh, year old audience and, and they, they're desperate to try and get into that not just for commercial reasons not just for advertising reason, reasons um, on the commercial channels but they, they do want access to your age group uh, and they want to tap into the things that are important to you um, so uh, you, you've got those stories, you, you know, no one else can tell them, I mean I could, I could do a bit of research and maybe come up with a few ideas that might interest you but I wouldn't be able to tell them as well as someone of your generation. So I think you've got to see that as a strength, really. Um, and, and, you know, if you've got good stories, then, you know, go for, you know, try and find the slots in which you could, um, you could get them screened. Uh, and we were speaking earlier on, Bridget, about, about trying to get into the right company at the right time. And maybe, I think you said... Um, you were you were an advocate for kind of going to try and get into a big company, to to mm. get that that get that kind of earn your stripes, learn the process, and then have that clout. I think I am, unless I'm you know an uh, auteur filmmaker and I just want to work on my own, do my own films. But I think if you want to work in television production more widely, you know I would you get much more experience, obviously, if you can get into a company that's making a wide variety of programmes, whether they're reality shows, documentaries, you know, formatted factual entertainment programmes. It would just mean you could you could move and get experience and you could find out what it is, what sort of programme. Do you like big studio entertainment shows? Do you like quiz shows? Do you want to make documentary? Do you want to, you know, work on sort of features competition programs like you know the bake-offs and all those sorts of things, all different sort of genre of programming but if you just want to be a filmmaker and make your own stories then i think that's a completely different thing um but i think if you want to work in in tv production generally um across a sort of slate i've worked on all sorts of different shows um uh and and i've you know and i know what i what i'm really interested in now but it's been great to have had that experience so uh, uh, that's m my advice would be to get to try and get a job within a production company that's big enough, a to sustain you. So you might finish that contract, but then oh we've got another one starting, and we could move you on to that. It would just the smaller the company is, obviously when that project's finished, it's finished, and you're looking for work again. Um, but I know that's not necessarily that easy. But if there are production companies that make shows that you like, I think they're the ones to target. Because, I mean, I cannot tell you how many people I've interviewed. And I say to them, so what of the, of the output that we make have you really enjoyed watching? And they'll look at me and like, what, you've sort of expected me to watch what you've made. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, yes. Um, and it's just embarrassing. It's embarrassing for everybody. I think, well, don't think you can come and work here if you haven't had given us the courtesy of actually watched anything we've actually made. So it, that really does irritate me. And, of course, they don't get the job. Um, so I would just say, what, is, what sort of programmes do you like? And therefore, think about who makes those sorts of shows and target those, um, you know, target those production companies. They'll all have databases. They'll all have an HR talent person that keeps people's CVs. You just have to keep badgering. But, you know, if it is your desire to work on Bake Off or your desire to work on you know, Top Gear or whatever it might be, think about who makes it and, and target them. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's have a look at another clip then, shall we? Because we talked about true crime there um, and getting that sort of thing commissioned. So we've got a clip here, it's clip four, and it's don't pick up the phone. pretending to be a police officer was apparently convincing enough to talk some managers into sexually abusing fast food employees. If I didn't submit to this search, then I'd be either arrested or lose my job or both. 
a couple of police officers telling me there's a video of what happened here. I'd never seen anything like it, and I've still never seen anything like it in 30 years. I'm on the phone, and he starts telling me the process. Take off her blouse. Here comes one article of clothing off, and then another article of clothing off. Yeah, I don't think there was anywhere he probably didn't touch. Check her crevices for drugs. He wanted him to describe my breasts, what my genitalia looked like, and even my bra size. I was mind blown. The psychology employed by the caller was amazing. I didn't know what this guy was capable of. I just know that this is a bad guy. The caller, of course, committed the perfect crime because he's completely anonymous. Burger Kings and Taco Bells, every restaurant you could think of was a victim of this caller. We have a sexual predator on the loose. And the phone's still ringing every day. Wow. There you go. Uh, streaming on Paramount, Paramount Plus, I think you said. Yeah, in the it? UK, it's available on Paramount Plus. Mm -hmm. But it has a different title. Uh, in, uh, on Paramount Plus in the UK, it's called Pervert Hunting the Strip Search Caller which is a terrible, terrible title. Um, but globally, it's available only... It's, uh, globally, it's on Netflix, but in the UK, it's on Paramount. Um, so a bit of a disappointment, but they came in for the UK rights, and, you know, we're not one to turn down money, so we took it. <laughs> um, and how, how did that come about? Oh, um, I've got a great development team. I mean, that's an area of TV we haven't really talked about but I'm completely dependent on my development team because they come up with all the ideas. So, um, uh, you know, we have meetings every week and we focus on certain channels, what the briefs are, and they come up with slates of ideas for me. Um, and, you know, uh, I've got an excellent development producer who seems to ferret out the best stories ever, and he came to me with this. You know, as a top line, I said... I think this is great. Are you sure it's not been done? Because that's the trouble with all true crime at the moment. It's all been done. And, and then if you find out it hasn't been done, by the time you've got hold of them, they're probably on an option from another company with a lot more money than you've got. Um, but it just, it just fell in out. You know, it, it all fell well for us. We, um, <coughs> we tracked down... That's Buddy Stump on there, the detective. <laughs> Buddy we Stump. Buddy Stump down. He was the detective who um, uh, brought the hoax caller to trial. And also Vic Flirty, is the, he wasn't in the... Sorry, uh, Vip Vic Flirty. Vic Flirty, he's called. He's the other detective. Because the story is essentially two detectives' mission to bring the hoax caller to justice. And we got hold of him, put them both on options, which means they couldn't talk to another company for, say, six months. Um, by, by that, you mean pay them? We paid them, yeah, uh, a, a, a small fee, but just to get exclusivity to get ourselves the opportunity to be able to pitch it. Um, and we then started to obviously get uh, other contributors, sort of seek them out at the same time, write a full treatment. And we also did a sizzle reel and we sent it round uh, to all broadcasters. And um, Paramount Plus actually came in first and said, yeah, we're really interested, we want to take it. But Netflix are, is such a huge organisation, they're quite slow. And then they came back and said, yeah, we're really interested, we'd like to take it. And we were like, yes! God, how brilliant is that? And we were so excited. But, you know, we'd sort of given UK rights to Paramount+. Plus. But um, they said, it's OK, we'll just take rest of world and um, match fund. And, you know, if you've, you... But in the contract, you had to show that you had optioned them. You can't say, oh, you know, oh whoopsie daisy. You know, we we said we had those detectives, but we haven't really got them now. Um, you have to, as part of your contract, uh, display who you've actually got. So, um, yeah, we went into we were in production for about a year. It was all filmed in America. Um, we had an American female director, and um, but the rest of the team were all based in the UK. And then we did a lot of the reconstruction, drama reconstruction filming in a facility in uh, Norfolk. 
uh, there's a company called October Films who do a lot of uh, true crime and they have bought an RF hanger. And this would be really interesting if you're interested in this sort of thing. They've bought an RF hanger and they've turned it into a sort of drama recon location. So they've got American cars and, you know, taxis and they've got the full replica of the White House. Um, it's it's astonishing place. And you can go there and do your dramatic reconstructions there. So a lot of what we did um, wasn't actually in America. So the fast food bars and everything that we've created, we created them there. Mm. So October Films is a huge like, independent American film company. I'm, uh, it's a rabbit hole to go down, but I'm just interested how they ended up in Norfolk, because I had heard um, about that. Actually, it's a different October Films, because they're, oh, they're, yeah, they're a British... Uh, oh, right, film they just company. stole the yeah. name. Fair yeah. enough. It might be, they might be called o October Studios, actually, right, not right. films. You're mm. probably right with that. Yeah, they're a British-based company who make a lot in America and couldn't afford to keep going out to America to do all their recon. So they thought, do you know what? We'll, um, we'll buy an RF hangar in Norfolk. But they bring everybody in. They bring in all the crews, you know, so camera, sound, lighting, set design, um, makeup, you know, costume everyone they bring in and they do it like a sort of drama shoot um, and it's really interesting a really interesting place and a great facility to get that American feel without having to spend a fortune in America um, is, is, is anyone got any questions at this point because if you have chuck your hand up in the air uh, I, I, you know what I thought there's going to be one person in this room that's got a question uh, and it's my man at the back, TK. So uh, we'll go to him. But there is also another man I thought will probably ask a question. That's you, because you ask lots of questions in these things. Hi, both. How are you doing? Thank um, you, Tony. Good. I was wondering if I could get sort of both your opinions on... So sometimes filmmakers will take a, a true life story and turn it into a drama rather than documentary. So what do you both feel are the strengths of the documentary format in bringing a true life to the screen? Well, I think they both have value. I mean, I couldn't, you know... At the moment, what you'll find is that a lot of, um, a lot of dramas also have the accompanying factual documentary with them. So, you know, I can't think of anything now. Litvinenko. Yeah, Litvinenko, uh, yeah. Or, Navalny. Um, that's um, there's wrong, the, the, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to do one at the moment that is a documentary on an ITV existing drama. I think they both really have value because who doesn't love a great drama? But then seeing the actual people speak um, and, you know, the, the people who have gone through this thing, they are the actual people, I, I don't think you can beat that either, really. But I do think that there's, um, th th there's a real, f um, I suppose, fad at the moment to do them both. So you always notice that if the company, say ITV or the BBC, have commissioned a, um, a big drama, there'll be the doc on it as well. The Dharma thing had that, didn't it? It's sort of like that came yeah. out recently. But but also we watched the the Marilyn uh, tapes. The lost was it called the lost Marilyn tapes? Mm. And that's strange. So they've got the voices. They've got the original tape recordings of her and all the Kennedys and all those people there. But they've got actors, voice you know mouthing. Um, so it's so it's it's a strange mixture of drama. Well, it, it's, it's not, it's quite, it's not, it's not reconstruction. Quite, it's not quite as bad as you've made it sound. No, actually. no, it's better. It's really, it really works. It does work. <laughs> it did actually but, work, I thought. You know, because the people look a bit like so, the... So what they, ha what they have got is loads and loads of tapes. This 70-year-old guy's got a load of tapes that he, he, film, he, he recorded, audio tapes only, that he recorded um, with all sorts of people involved in the whole Marilyn you know, world at that time. So for a documentary, you've either got, well, what do I do? I've got a load of audio tapes. That's going to be really boring. So that's a radio doc, isn't it, really? So yeah. what they decided to do was, was, and they did it with the AIDS documentary as well on um, BBC Two, is take the audio tapes and cast the people to look like the people, but the actual voice was still the, it was lip sync, was still the tape, but the, people, the actors were yeah. saying it. Mm. And they set the actors in a in a sort of uh, appropriate setting for the time. So, in, you know, lounges and bars and whatever that would reflect either the 80s for the AIDS doc or the 50s for the Marilyn doc. Um, and it just brought to life what would be quite a difficult watch if it was all audio and archived. There would be no, you know, no chance to cut away to actually see someone speak. 
So just different techniques like that are interesting yeah. to make the documentary That's come quite alive. a fresh way of doing it, I think. Mm. Um, I don't know whether that answers the question, Tony, does it? It, it does, thank you. Mm. <laughs> um, there was a question down at the front here, please, Ryan. Uh, hi, I was just wondering that um, from a, a writing standpoint, would you possibly have any sort of advice for writing? Because um, that at the moment I do, I, I do it on and off because my brain just doesn't want to sometimes. But uh, would you have any possibly any advice for writing, like from a story standpoint? Are you writing drama or are you are you writing factual? Uh, well, I am. Uh, from what it is, I'm writing like basically my own stories from the uh, Thomas the Tank Engine universe. So basically, right. just like stuff around that, and just mm. um, basically for for example, for one I'm doing at the moment, I'm taking an already existing episode and but writing it from another character's perspective. Right. So I was right. um, thinking of possibly. I, I mean, I think all. I think all. All drama it is about the storytelling and about the drama. I mean, everything's about drama, really. Yeah. You know, factual television. You know, there's got to be an arc to the story to keep keep people with you. Um, so, I think as a writer, you've got to have those almost acts uh, in the same way. I mean, I did a stint on um, Coronation Street years ago, and um, the great thing about that, although I haven't gone down the drama route, was that you. There's all those ABC stories that are going on, and you realise from in, in episodes of soaps that they're they're really cleverly constructed. So it's not just one linear story, um, you know, that takes you from A to B. There's lots more things going on, and it's how it's how you structure, I think, uh, dramas and documentaries that keeps an audience with you. Um, and you'll know from stuff you watch yourself, you know, whether. You, you know, sometimes things flag a bit. You know, may maybe the first five minutes you think this is going to be great, and then maybe it, there's a lull to it. And it's it's how you, as a writer, you you keep propelling the story forward, um, and it, you've got to keep people on board. I mean, that's that's the only way that um, TV works and film works. I mean, suppose film you've got more of a captive audience uh, if they're in a cinema, but you know, if you're watching it at home. You sort of, after about 15 minutes, you sort of think, am, am I going to stick with this or not? And it's, um, you know, so the skill of the writer is keeping people on board. Um, so we have, a, we have a few more clips to, to run. Um, and in regards to watching those, we can sort of maybe decide that. But I just thought before we did that, um, you have been awarded money to, um, from the BBC. Uh, about growth within the East Midlands Len. Um, I just was interested to know about what your plans are with that money and that sort of process that you've gone through to get there uh, and what the future looks like with what you're doing. Well, there's two, there's two sort of main funds for, for small indies. Um, and I think, th uh, I think they, ca uh, they define a small indie as under 10 million a year turnover. Um, and um, so you apply for these. Uh, Channel 4 have got an emerging indie fund we went the BBC route. We've got we've done more for the BBC, um, so we went to the small indie fund, and basically they give you a chunk of money to develop your company, and it, it sort of buys you time to uh, come up with more ideas uh, and maybe to restructure your company. Um, it, so we're bringing a business development executive on board, um, and we're bringing a, a young researcher on board as well, um, and. The idea is that you tell stories from the, the region you're in. I mean, that's one of the, the, the main criteria. So, you know, we're looking for stories from this region. You want um, any stories? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you also get a commissioning mentor at the BBC who you have to pitch ideas to. And they're supposed to be a sort of gatekeeper and they'll help you um, win business. I mean, it's all about winning business. Um, and uh, I think also... Uh, because of all the other platforms, you know, like Netflix, Amazon, Apple, all these things that are um, uh, are out there now, the, the BBC wants to try and get these stories. Yeah, you know, they want to try and have a sort of stake in in the stories you're developing, and they hope that you'll come to them. 
they can't they can't force you to go to them but you know if there are strong stories that we've got um, from this region then we'd probably go to the BBC first um, so it, it's all about development it's all about trying to build the company um, particularly in a region that's that um, is a bit under underdeveloped you know as, as I was saying before that all the money tends to go west you know it tends to go Bristol Birmingham um, Manchester Salford Glasgow um, so we're hoping that the trend starts to move more easterly. Um, yeah. And in, in regards to, you, you, you know, when you said a small business and then you said the words under £10 million, mm -hmm. uh, I think some people might be looking, thinking a small business under 10,000 or under 10 quid. So um, yeah. from like an entry level for people in the audience that are considering maybe um, making their own production company and kind of like setting out on their own, what would your advice be to those people? Anyone thinking of doing that here? Oh, don't bother with that question then. I, 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 I assume that, that they might want I to do that. I think there's opportunities in film as well. We should say that. I mean, obviously there, you know, there's a lot of crossover now between uh, TV, high-end TV, film and um you know so you can and there's a lot of funding for for young filmmakers so if you go on to things like the creative england website and look at uh, opportunities there there's certain film um, bodies uh, that that do a lot with with young filmmakers as well particularly screen yorkshire um so if you can move into yorkshire and um you know pitch from there that might help but um I, you know, so I think that, that uh, you should explore, if, if you want to set up as a filmmaker, um, yeah, you could set up your own company, but that does need a lot of, a lot of support, really. You sort of need to win a couple of things first right. and then feel more confident. As Bridge says, it might be, it might be good to get in with, with one of the big indies. You know, there's quite a few major indies like um, Endemol Shine, uh, IMG, Fremantle. If you, you know, if you if you look on, um, if, in fact, if you look on the um, the um, Screen Skills website, um, there, there's a sort of list of key indies on there that are worth, and then go on to their websites and see what their opportunities are. But you, you know, if you could start sort of winning business through one of them, um, then. Maybe, I, maybe go from there, I don't know. I, just, I th think it's a tiny bit unrealistic. I think that these days you don't need to have a broadcaster. If you're, the platforms are out there, you know, YouTubes and all, all these other sorts of ways of getting content out without going through mm. a broadcaster mm. is, is slightly easier when you're, when you're starting up. You know, I mean, you're saying you're working with a YouTuber who's got... How many thousands of uh, followers? Two, one of them's got two million, and one of them's got uh, two about million followers. Million. I mean, that's more it's than monetizing, though, isn't it? That's mm. the, that's the difficulty with that. I think you know how you make money <coughs> out of it. Um, but you can, you know, content creation. It can go anywhere, can't it? You don't yeah. always need to go through the traditional routes. And we're mm. too far too long in the tooth to know how to do all that. But it seems to me it's a very exciting time mm. to be making content because you can place it in all sorts of places that we couldn't. There was only about bloody four channels when we started. Um, so, you know, it was far, far more restrictive, whereas I, I just feel the opportunities are almost endless now, depending what, what sort of content you want to make, and where you mm. want to place it. Um, it's just a whole different world. Yeah. And not one, actually, that we're very good at talking about. <laughs> You'll have to get someone else in a lot younger. Well, they, they are, and they are. <laughs> yeah. So that's the great thing, yeah. and that's why you're here, because they get a bit of everything. Um, and, yeah, as we discussed earlier, it seems that, you know, content creators are then being commissioned directly. Yeah, so I mean, I think they, they are, you know, sort of um, these, you know, YouTube and Instagram there's also the digital platforms at each of the broadcasters. Yes, there are. Do you, you know, know Channel like Four, Channel Four's digital and short films. You know, there's BBC you know, Three. Yeah. You don't. Want, you, it's unrealistic to think you'll get a commission with a main channel from from the get go if you've got no experience of delivering before. Mm. You'd need to be working in a in a bigger company to get that experience to start with. But then you don't need to do it if you if you're going to bypass traditional commissioning. Uh, there was a hand in the air over there, so we're going to come back to it. Mr. Cash? 
it? Yes, it is. So on the, uh, was that your first Netflix commission, Don't Pick Up the Phone? And, yeah. And so now you've had that first commission with, or, or kind of product with Netflix. One more come, do you think? Is it, is it easier now you've got one yeah. foot in the door? Yeah, it, it's the same with everything. Once you've done it once and you've proved you can do it, now they'll take a meeting and now they'll respond to our treatments, whereas before we'd be one of the thousands that are landing on the desk that don't even probably open. I mean, that's the reality of it. There's far, far too many production companies and far too few opportunities. Um, and, you know, it, it just that one, you know, that break, that this good story that we managed to get and we delivered it well, they're really pleased with it. Um, we hadn't made for them before. Um, I mean, there's a company called Raw that make um, an awful lot for Netflix. So a UK company, they make Don't Fuck With Cats, they make Tinder Swindler. They really, really got a great reputation and they sort of clean up, I feel, all the UK possibilities with Netflix. And, and so we were just really delighted to get in the door there and get that show. And now we having more, much more regular meetings. So, but they're only going to, you know, it's not, we've still got to come up with another great idea, but at least we've got a dialogue. It, it's the same with any uh, broadcaster, but, but much more so with, with Netflix, because um, it's just the bar is so much higher with them. And does that change the direction of your development team in terms of the, now the yeah. sorts of ideas they're looking at? Yeah, I mean, it, they've just got to be so big. And to last three parts, the twists and turns and reveals that you've got to deliver. So again, you have to write that. It's almost like a thesis. You have to write it and, and show where your end of parts come in, what your cliffhanger is. You know, you write it. You write the entire thing out. Um, and y yeah, the, the, so the, the bar is a lot higher, but they pay significantly more. So the bar's not, you know, at Channel 5, you, I can come up with sort of a top of the head concept. We write it up. We put a few pictures in, make it into a bit of a deck, send it off. And if they like the general idea and they'll think it'll work for their audience, they will go for it. Um, but, but Netflix put you into development. So you have almost feel you've made the show before you actually get the commission. They want to be absolutely certain that it's going to work if they're going to pay that sort of money. Yeah. And who decides that it's because it, was it three parts that don't pick up yeah. the phone? Who decides that it's three three episodes and not four or five or, or less? Well, th it's up to you to pitch it what you think it's worth. Um, and we pitched it at three because you've obviously got the crime, the investigation, the trial. It does it lends itself quite neatly to a three part structure. Um, so we wrote it in that in that way, and they they bought into that. But um, sometimes what the Netflix commissioner said to me that they have so many great ideas and they take I mean, a fraction of those ideas and only a fraction of those get commissioned. But the reason most of them get knocked down is because they don't think it sustains. I mean, I'm amazed because I've watched a lot of Netflix things. I think, God, you strung this right out. You know, God, you could have done this in two. You know, and you've got six. You know, so I don't always agree with that. But that's what they're looking for is... Uh, it's it, what they call it stickiness. They want the viewer to immediately hit play and go again, you know, on the next one to uh, stream it. And they have all metrics of how they um, record that. And we had quite a high um, metric on our completion, which is seen as very good because a lot of people flick on, like Len says, maybe watch the first 10 minutes and think, oh, it's not for me. But, but they can see the completion rate of a series if you get high completion rate, then they, th they see that as a real bar of success. And do they let you know the, the viewing figures now, or do they still keep those secret? Uh, no, they do let us know them, but I, it, I can't make head and tail of them, really. It's mm -hmm. like they're talking millions of streams and this, that and the other, and it doesn't mean anything. I can understand our overnights in the UK because you've got something to measure it against, but when they told me, I was writing it down, and I was thinking, well, sounds all right, but you, know, you don't really know how that compares with something else. But they have these metrics that they score you on. And uh, one of them is the full how many streams, but the others are things like completion. And um, I can't remember what the others are now, but I have written them down. But overall, we, were, we scored well. That's all I really cared about at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. I found it very creatively um, um, stretching because I've made an awful lot in my, my career for uh, British broadcasters. But to make for a big um, American streamer, it is different, because we use no voiceover. 
And um, although that's become much more common in the UK now, it wasn't common. And to make a no VO doc series is quite challenging um, because you've really, really got to push your interviewees to cover everything so you can then cut to your next piece without the you know, luxury of going through a piece of tying VO that's going to get you there. And so that's been quite a skill, and I've really enjoyed the creative process on that. So even, you know, even this far in one's career, you can, you can still, I think, be really stimulated to do something different uh, and push yourself to achieve a higher bar of quality, um, which is what they, they definitely demand in the way that it looks, the way that it's shot, everything about it. They sort of have a bar of, of excellence that they're trying to achieve. One more, if that's all right, Tim. No, you, do, you go for it. I'm just fascinated about the, 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 the change in title between Netflix and Paramount, and, and obviously you were happy with the Paramount title, so what, how much say do you have in, in what you want the programme called that you've made? None. I mean, that's the truth of it. You, you, you really don't. Ben, ben Frau, who is the director of programmes at Channel 5, is, is notorious for having you know, Ron Seal-style st titles on his... Um, uh, or, you know, so they appear on the EPG because he's fighting for for viewers on a channel that's got far far less money. So he he screams his title right at you to get people to click on, and it's a, str a strategy that's worked for him because you know Channel Five is doing very well. It's competing almost neck neck and neck with Channel Four at the moment. Um, so he has done well, but in this uh, on this occasion, I was uh, honestly I was gutted. I could not believe he was going to call it that. Um, so yeah, you, you just it's not in it's not in our gift really the the title. I've got a question for you, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite Spice Girl? That's an interesting question. Um, back in the day, it was probably probably Sporty Spice. Who's your favourite? Let's find out. <laughs> uh, why I'm asking Jamie that question? Well, there's a little clip we've got here, um, which uh, might be interesting. Sorry. You wanted to say Jerry, didn't you? Well, it would have it would have yeah. helped my yeah. segue a little bit better. Of course, Jerry. Yeah, of course, it's Jerry. <laughs> yeah, um, you've spoilt it, Jamie. Now. So, so we've got. I think just before you went, did you yeah. the guy in the green top? I think you had yeah. a question. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, this term that I've now uh, forgotten uh, in the pre-production for "Don't pick up the phone." Uh, when you were going for the story uh, with the individuals that are going to be able to tell the story, and yeah. you mentioned that there were potentially the other agreements. Yes, yes, that's the one. And you were mentioning that there are potentially other production companies that are going for the same yeah. story at the same time. What, how important is it to get you know people before you go forward with the production to have the story or the people that are going to tell your story on board, especially when you're working against other production companies at the same time? I mean, I think that's the real challenge at the moment in television is exactly that, is um, we all have the same ideas. Most people read this, have the same sort of news feeds, reading the same sort of things, and it's I incredible. You'll have a development meeting on the Monday morning and everyone's got the same idea because they've seen it. So if that's in your own company, just imagine that times by whatever. Everyone's on the same thing, so you'll end up chasing stories that other companies are also chasing. Now... The only thing is, it's embarrassing for you if you pitch it and they say, yeah, we really like this, and then you find out you haven't got them. I mean, your likelihood of getting a commission again by, through that commission is quite small because they think, what are you doing wasting my time? I've gone through this whole commissioning process and you haven't even got them. So I'm, uh, I'm really fastidious on um, getting people. I only pay them, say, 500 quid to option them. I send them this standard letter and they give me three months to have it exclusively to try to pitch. Um, that's only on really things that everyone's going for, you know, that stories that you feel that are in the news that, you know, everyone's going to be after. Um, so um, I, 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 think it, I do think it's really important, but it's, it's, a, it's a very um, more current thing that people are doing because I feel that the big stories, the really good stories, um, everyone wants to secure for themselves. So it's like first... First dibs, if you know what I mean. If you're in first, try and get them to sign. And some people won't, and some people are also, you know, charging an awful lot to go on an option agreement. And you think, well, what if I don't get it commissioned? I've just paid you five grand, and I've got, you know, I didn't even get it. So it's a risk, but, you know, I think it's definitely worth doing to secure it for yourself.
for a certain amount of time. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Who's your favourite Spice Girl? <laughs> Oh, never mind, Jamie. Jerry you, Halliwell, you thank you. You don't have to show <laughs> Jerry Cliff. We don't need to do Jerry, do we? don't need to do, yeah. Um, yeah. What, um, what, what, we have some clips left to play. Uh, we've got the Monaco clip, and we, we also have the, um, the Canny Masons, but we've, we've kind of moved beyond that now. Do you want to watch the Monaco? Is it worth looking at that before we wrap up? Or? Um, you I mean, can, fin you can finish on Monaco, Monaco's can you? Monaco's more recent than Jerry. We made that quite a long time ago. So maybe yeah. just say Monaco. Yeah, great. Let's, should we watch that then, please? Uh, it's this was six. a BBC Two three-part factual series that went out um, in 2021. Thank you. You never get bored in Monaco. There is always this picture that we are swimming in the caviar all day long. In Monaco, the helicopter is considered like a car. Every morning I'm like, oh my god, I'm living in a dream. Step into a world where too much is never enough. 28,000 euros. Would you like another drink, sir? Inside Monaco, on BBC Two and iPlayer. Yeah, just a trailer. Um, so, um, Bridget, can you tell us a bit about that and, um, and the access that you have? Well, um, it's actually, again, uh, it's all about access, and it was a co-pro. It was a co-pro with a company called Whisper, who are, um, are doing incredibly well in, in live sports. They do the F1 and, um, oh, you know, the pa Paralympics. Um, they do, I don't know, the cricket. I, c I can't remember what they do. They're a huge, huge sports company. Um, uh, they are diversifying as well. I know they've opened Whisper North. I think in Manchester. Um, anyway, because they do the Formula One, they have got good relations. They do it, in, you know, all around, but in Monaco, they have good relations with um, uh, Prince Rainier, you know, of Monaco, because he owns the whole of Monaco. Sorry. Albert, yeah, Rainier's dead, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so they had this potential access because Monaco is notoriously difficult to film in because it's it's you know almost like a police state. Um, and they aren't documentary makers, so uh, Whisper Films came to my company and said, we think we, could, um, we think we could deliver this sort of access, would you be interested? And we're like, yeah, we'd be really interested. So we worked up a proposal and um, put it into BBC Two, and they were like, yeah, no, well, we'll definitely have this, because they promised us access to the palace, to his life, to the events, to the casino, the um, Hotel de Paris, uh, the F1 that was taking place there. So all events that were really, really difficult to get access to, uh, we suddenly seemed to have it. And so the, the BBC said, yeah, we'll take three parts on that. And it was um, the most successful factual programme of 2021 on BBC Two. Got about four million, which was unheard of on, on BBC Two. So I think it's just a window into a world of luxury that you didn't, you, you don't usually see, um, and obviously because it's for the B, it's for BBC Two, it wasn't just let's just have a look at it and just think Ugh, or wow. It was you know trying to give it an underpinning of some sort of you know intellectual rigor, and and look at how the country works, how the tax system works, how, what, what, what happens if you live there and you're actually born there, what rights do you have as a monogasque? And actually really good ones, you get priority for jobs, priority for schooling, priority for housing. Well, why is that? Why, why do they get all those priorities? Because obviously they need to keep, keep him in power. He doesn't, want his, he doesn't want the peasants revolting, as it were. So there, was, there were things that we tried to explore in Monaco above and beyond just showing all the fabulous places and people that live there. Um, so, you know, it, I think an interesting documentary series, and again, really enjoyed making that one. Um, can you tell us just a little bit, um, and, and then maybe we'll take the final questions, but just the kind of um, the logistics and practicalities of co-productions? Yeah, I mean, they're not always easy, um, but the co-production in that sense was just was 50-50, uh, but the editorial responsibilities uh, lied with our company because we were the doc makers and could get the commission through BBC documentaries. Whereas Whisper are a live sports events producer. 
like we, I couldn't go and make the Formula One suddenly, whereas they can, but they can't just go and make documentary. So um, it, it, it was fine. Um, they were much more concerned about their relationship with the prince and the powers that be in Monaco than I was. So they were always trying to, you know, make me be as polite as possible. So I didn't upset their relationships, which obviously we didn't. But at the same time, they had promised quite a lot of access. And then by the end, they seemed to be slightly withdrawing from that access. And I said, well, you promised it and we promised the BBC, so we need to deliver this. And we did in the end, but you remember that. Was it mm. quite hard, wasn't it, getting yeah. Prince Albert to turn up and, and, and give us access to the, uh, you know, interview, et cetera? Because you can't give people control over, particularly BBC ones, you can't give them control over... Oh, I've got cramp in my thigh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over the... wall injuries. Over do you want a massage? <laughs> over you, why don't you stand up and get off this funny chair? Um, yeah, you can't, you can't give anyone control over... BBC production, so so he didn't have any say in it. Um, so the access was vital, but um, uh, you know there was no comeback from him, him over it. Um, but I mean, it, it, co-pros are because like the next Kenny Mason ones a co-pro again with WAG, with the company that Bridget works for, and part of that is because there's not the people locally to. Um, to do some of those jobs, you know, you ne you need experienced people, um, and so we, hopefully, going forward, we'll be able to employ more people locally. Mm. But at the moment, we're we're dependent on people from outside this area. Mm. I've just noticed you've got very fresh-looking Air Force Ones there, actually. Uh, yeah. Len. Well, yeah. do you do you want to know the the background to this? Oh, I mean, I'm sure we all do. Yeah. Come um, on. Our younger daughter works for Nike. Sweet. So she's a. Specialist, marketing specialist. Marketing specialist. So uh, in Amsterdam. Yeah. So yeah, these came in a uh, in a very nice box that actually said on it Len, uh, Len for Nike. Oh wow! Um, no, they they so are fresh I've, crepes. I've got another pair of denim. Uh, not everyone wants to know your shoe collection. That's well, not that's my way. Come on, man. These are young no, people. They're, they're Jordan. Look they're they're um, they're Jordan sort of denim ones, aren't they? They're collect, the collector's, collector's items, items but I they look, after them, they look terrible. No one would buy them <laughs> at all, they're worth, ever. they're worth about three grand, apparently. They're oh, not. They? Believe me, put, they're not. Put sellotape on the bottom so <laughs> yeah. that you can walk around in them. Yeah. Um, so just finally on the, on the yeah. co-production stuff. I mean, the most... I mean, you've co-produced children. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I know. So, so how does it work? Like, there may be people, and I'm sure it's likely that over time uh, in this industry, it's very... So it's a very intimate industry. Everyone knows everybody, and you end up in a relationship. How does that work, and uh, and how? What's the sort of dynamic between you two? It, it must cause problems, but you navigate them. It's all right as long as he does as I say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. That's about <laughs> it. Yeah. I mean, because uh, I sort of, I think I said earlier that you know I got to that exec producer level, and I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't really enjoy running teams. I'm not sort of managerial sort of person. I quite like the actual production producer role where you're hands-on you can control that production rather than you know handing it over to maybe I'm just not very good at delegating but um, I prefer to be more hands-on whereas Bridge is is much better at managing and managing up as well she you know dealing with commissioning editors dealing with the broadcasters so we, I think we're quite a good team when it works are we yes dear <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the first time she's ever said, yes, dear. It's usually, no, that's not correct. But, it, you know, it's just, I think it does help working in the same industry because TV, the, the hours are quite long as when it's quite intense. You know, when you're in production, um, I mean, Bridget's schedule at the moment is like crazy because she's got these crime docs and all these lawyers um, looking at stuff. So it's, it, it's been fairly sort of hard, hasn't it, recently, until you get, she's got another one called... Well, she's got two ITV docs called... One's called The Real Fatal Attraction, which is uh, about um, an attempted sort of murder, really. Um, a stalker, bunny boiler. Mm. Yeah, um, and you've got another fraud, fraud one, haven't you? Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Big, fra big fraud one, Instagram fraud. Um, so, th yeah, they're sort of like the contemporary crime stories that people seem to want at the moment, less sort of serial killing of young women which i'm not a big fan of um a bit more contemporary crime 
but yeah, I mean, it, it works okay. I don't. Th we don't work together full on all the time. I I just exec for MBM Lens Company, um, uh, which means which means I'll um, boss them about. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not doing the job, then you know. Yeah. No, it, it, it means that I, I like let's say, I'll do m a lot of the negotiations with the broadcaster and I'll be ultimately responsible for the editorial and the legal compliance, whereas Lem was much more on the ground with the talent and on location and things like that. I'm, I'm much more sort of light touch because I've got another full-time job, so I can't, you know, I'm not all over your projects. You tend to do no. them on your own. I'm not very good at sort of fronting up the difficult issues where she just says it, you know. She'll just, she doesn't worry what, what I people... Do worry, you do you worry, but yeah, but you get, it. you're more direct um, than that, whereas I sort of tend to just try and do it quite nicely. I mean, I'm quite good with talent. I think I'm always quite good with the talent. Um, and, they always and like Len and never like me. We don't believe that, do <laughs> no, we? No, no well, you see, you, they were going to show you the Jerry Halliwell clip. We made a, a, a documentary on her... And uh, she loved Len, she hated me. So if just, you know, women telling another woman, can we do this, can we do that? Oh, she was so difficult. Turned up late and, oh, I couldn't bear her. Um, Who's your favourite anyway. Spice Girl? No, I'm joking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Three times. Not her. Uh, <laughs> mm. But, you know, managing talent is quite a big part of it. Um, you know, managing relationships with all, all the teams. Um, and, you know, one of the most interesting things for me is and this is why I agreed to come and do this, is I do like to try to um, encourage people into the industry and give them breaks and opportunities. Like I'm really keen on trying to get more female directors, um, uh, you know, give them breaks and give them shows. And it's, that's really difficult. Again, directing is a thing like, what, what did they last do? What's the last credit? And you're only as good as your last big directorial piece. And it's dominated by men. And... Um, I've just given a two-parter big ITV nine o'clock um, show to a female director that w produced on, on the one you saw, Don't Pick Up the Phone. I thought she was really good. She'd had a lot of directing experience, but she just hadn't got her own single credit, director credit. So I've given her that opportunity and she's done a brilliant job. Commissioner's really pleased with it. And now that's her set now. She can, you know, she's a director. She can go and do, do that. So uh, you get a lot of, I certainly get a lot of, lot out of trying to pull people through in different parts of their careers, particularly when I see that they're really talented. They just need a break. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing that, because that's what we, we need. Um, just before we wrap up then, any more questions from anybody? Uh, JB, any more from you? No. <laughs> Have I missed anything? Uh, TK, backstick. Hi there. I was wondering if I can talk to you a little bit sort of about how you find that balance between sort of planning and, and deciding the story before the shoots and, and whether there's any room left now in documentary storytelling for the story to evolve organically through the shoot and, and in, in post. Um, well, I, it depends on the sort of documentary you're doing. If you're doing access-based doc, you know, like 24 hours in A&E, although you've got a, a, a precinct and a construct, you have to, the story has to evolve because you don't know what's coming in. So I think there are lots of different sort of documentaries, usually access-based to, you know, whether it's police or ambulance. I mean, ambulance is a really good example of a brilliant documentary series on BBC One. Um, it has a structure, again, around it, but, but it's, it, 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 it all happens and they don't know what's going to happen. But they've got enough sort of format, I wouldn't call them format beats, but enough structure around the storytelling that they know what they need. Um, but, but they don't know exactly what they need because who knows who's going to have an accident. So uh, in that sort of documentary, I think you need to know what you're, what, you, what you're ideally after and the beats that you need to tell that story. Like, oh, I've got to get retrospective consent from X because we want to feature their story in this, blah, blah. I think in others, though, I think you need to almost pre-script it so you know mm. exactly what you're doing. Um, I mean, hoax was, well, hoax, I call it hoax, don't pick up the phone, w was largely, you know, pre-scripted in the sense that we knew how we wanted the story to work. And it does change, but not a lot. 
in some ways, because the story's cold case, so you know what the beats are, you know what you've got to deliver. But So I think that's the difference between access-based docs and something that you are... Um, you might not know the story, but you sort of know what you need from the story. So it's the ups, the downs, you know, the cliffhanger. So it's all about thinking... Um, uh, thinking widely about what you need, but being flexible enough to go with it if you get something better and not being afraid to do that. So I tell a lot of the directors when they go out, this is what we ideally want you to come back with. But if, if something better starts to happen, go with that instead. You've got to trust your instinct and then come back and say, what happened? You know, And if you've got it, that's great. But you can't predict... But you've got, to, you've got to go out with a strong enough plan. So you've got to know, A, you can fill the day, that you've got the people in the right places, that you've got your crews, you've got your contributors set, you've got, plan, you know, you've got all the filming permissions that you need. So much that needs to be sorted in these days uh, that there's very little room for a, a, a lot of um, stuff just to happen. Um, but you don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes those moments arise and you were never really quite sure what, what was going to happen. And I, I've just been judging the factual director for BAFTA and I watched a show, you may have all seen it, I, I was really, my stomach was turned by it, but it was called My Dead Body and um, they did a live autopsy uh, uh, on the show of this woman who had donated her body to science and she, her voice is in it, you know, like from the grave as it were, you know, it was a bit like that documentary, the boy's skin fell off, but... Um, I think that they knew what they wanted out of this, but still you couldn't really gauge quite what the reaction was going to be of the medical students when they basically took the head off and the brain out. I mean, I was watching thinking, oh, my God. So there was a lot that you had to respond to in that. You knew what was going to happen, but there's so much you had to respond to as a director, I think, to capture the moments of what was really going on. Um, so I don't know if that's really answered it, but it's a lot of, a lot of pre-planning, but the confidence enough to go with something as it happens. Can I be uh, cheeky and ask one more question? Uh, go Jamie, on then. Jamie had um, about just ten. before you ask, is there any more student questions oh, before okay. we finish? Yeah. There's one more over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe oh, Tony, Tony, you could loiter around and, and, and ask as we leave. Hi, uh, so I wanted to ask, obviously you work with quite sensitive topics a lot of the time, specifically with your true crime. Like when you're dealing with kind of the legal stuff around it, especially with cases that are still going on, is that something you consider with lawyers and stuff, or do you have someone that kind of can do that for you so you can focus on the creative side of it? Well, I do have lawyers, like TV lawyers, who work in compliance and do advisors all the time. Um, so that is that is a big part of, of, my, of my role. But, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I have to take advice. But... Um, Dealing with the contributors on sensitive subjects, you're absolutely right. You've got to make sure that people uh, understand what they're agreeing to take part in and be very upfront about that. If you've got, they have to do a, like a, a, a statement, a statement of health questionnaire, but also a sort of, it's like a duty of care questionnaire. And if there are any red flags on that, they have to be referred to a psych who can assess whether they think that they are going to be competent enough or robust enough to do a TV interview. Because we're trying to protect too many people being put on TV who really shouldn't be there. Um, and these have got a lot more strict over time. So yeah, there is an awful lot of that to think about these days with your, and it's not just um, doing the interview, it's the reaction that you get when the show goes out, because people get terribly trolled and, and their lives made unbelievably unpleasant. Um, and so we do give them aftercare as well um, now to protect them and learn how to deal with their social media as a response to the shows that are, are put out. So I've got a follow-up question to that. Do you think there's work in the industry for people who are kind of interested in taking care of almost this boring stuff when it's with the paperwork, dealing with the legal stuff, so you can kind of leave the creative people to work on the documentary? Do I think there's room for those sorts of people? Yeah, the, so people who are willing to kind of be the middleman between the creative well, I, I side think, of it. I think, and there the are, I think there are those. Rules. When I say I do a lot of it, although I am managing the creative, 
um, my name's on the end of the programme, so it's ultimately my responsibility. But, but, but there are people like production executives and production management that I mentioned earlier. That is a large part of their job, is managing the, the um, contributors and also managing the legal process. So they're the ones that are making sure that the scripts are sent to the lawyers, that they're coming back, what are the action points we've got to do. I don't do the detail of that. They just come to me and say, this is the level of risk. We could put this out, but the lawyer says this is the level of risk. What level of risk am I prepared to take? So I make the final decision. But there are a lot of people who are working, as you say, behind the scenes to make sure that the people that we work with are cared for appropriately and that the programme is legally compliant. But that is a job. You know, you could be in production management or production exec and they would be a large part of what you do. The negotiation with the broadcaster on the contracts, that's a lot of what production management, the head of production do. So there's the creative side and then there's the production management side and they work side by side, but each side is equally important um, to, make, to get the programme on the air. They're absolutely, it's a team game, absolutely 100% delivering a show. It's never one person's vision. Director might get the credit at the end, but it's never, ever... One person's, bit, you know, one person's show. It's the involvement of loads and loads of talented people. Well, I think today's talk has really kind of shown that. We've seen a brilliant team right here in front of us, and um, you've articulated uh, that, um, that uh, all of your insight um, and experience around just how important that team is. So I, I just want to say a huge thank you. I want to say thank you to that gentleman over there for wearing shorts in this weather, because uh, that's, that's cheered me up. Uh, but, um, but I want to say a huge thank you, obviously, to Jamie and, and the rest of the team, Tony Kelly, for asking some insightful questions. Um, it's great to have Alison in the room as well. Uh, but to you both, because you've, you've, it it's flown by for me, but um, you've given us so much of your time um, and experience. So... Can we give them a massive round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. To Bridget and Len. Um, and yeah, I, I, hope, I hope we get to see you again. Thank you. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been really, really interesting. So thank you so much. Has it been useful? Great, yeah. And I, I seriously think it has. Um, have an amazing rest of the time of your industry week. Take advantage of everything you can because it's a seriously valuable week for you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you.